All righty. Hello, everyone. My name is Denny Patterson, and I am a writer with Instinct Magazine. Today, we have the fabulous Tom McRae. That's how you pronounce it, correct? Tom McRae? Very close. <laughs> Tom McRae? McRae. McRae. Tom McRae. <laughs> it's actually, the proper, well, it's English, but it's Scottish, but it's, it's Muck, even though it is spelled Mac. Well, I Americanized your name. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no one gets it, don't worry. Tom McRae, who is the book writer and lyricist for Everybody's Talking About Jamie, the smash hit musical from England. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So Everybody's Talking About Jamie will be making its U.S. debut in Los Angeles very soon. How, yeah. how excited are you for this? Well, we start rehearsals tomorrow. So, um, and I'm seeing, uh, I'm having dinner with Leighton tonight. Leighton plays Jamie. And I was out uh, in West Hollywood at the weekend and saw lots of posters around with our names on and Leighton's face. So it is very exciting. Yeah, I've lived in L.A. for quite a long time now. Um, so to bring my show, well, our show, I won't take all the credit, but to bring it to my hometown, <laughs> yes. uh, my new hometown is, is magical. Yeah. Very nice. Now, the musical is inspired by the 2011 British television documentary, Jamie, Drag Queen at 16. What made you want to adapt Everybody's Talking About Jamie for the stage? And does the story have any similarities to your own life? Well, the documentary was originally seen by Jonathan Butterell, our director, and um, Johnny had the idea that it would be a great musical and then found me and Dan, uh, Dan Gillespie Sells, who I write the songs with, the composer, to, um, to kind of bring it to life. And, and the three of us have been doing every version of Jamie from the stage show to, to the, you know, the global releases um, ever since. And uh, Johnny thought that it was a story that sang. Uh, and that, that's really what you look for. And there's no one way of a story singing. But when you watch a show and go, oh, that, that's a song there, that's a song there, watch a story rather, sorry, and you see how that can work without having to push it, um, then you, you can tell when it's there and it just sang. And so when we watched the documentary, me and Dan were instantly convinced that there's a song here, there's a song here. We could just see it. Uh, and uh, it was all from the heart. And I think enough people have come along to see it that we can say now that we were right. But at the time it was just an instinct and we just loved the story and we loved the characters so much. When I first met the real Margaret for the first time, I was genuinely starstruck uh, and Jamie as well. Uh, although we knew him a bit by then, Margaret was kind of the last person that we met from the real world. Uh, and then in terms of my own life, well, I grew up in a little village near uh, a, um, uh, near Northampton, which is a small town, and a little village is a very, very small town, smaller than what you're imagining. And Jamie is kind of from a similar community. Uh, mine was more southern than his, uh, but in terms of the parental support, my my parents were always great, and they supported me in everything I wanted to do. Jamie's dad is 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 a thorn in his side, and my dad isn't at all. He's the biggest Jamie fan there is. He's even got a cameo in the movie. Nice. Playing an, an elderly gay rights protester in a flashback, which was a which was a very special day for us all. So it's not really very much like me at all. The only bit in it that's me really is when Pretty Pasha, Jamie's best friend, she has this speech at the end. It's kind of really the only. There's only two speeches in the show because I think mm -hmm. speeches. Are, I try to not write speeches because people don't really talk in speeches. I'm very strict. Writers love writing speeches, but I I think audiences don't always enjoy listening to them. So um, there's only two, and the second one is is pretty where she just takes down the bully, and everything she says is what I wish I was brave and clever and funny enough to have said when I was her age. But other than that, it was all about connecting with Jamie's world and then adapting it into into Jamie News World, which is yeah. the, a fictional version of Jamie. Very nice, very nice. Now, are you surprised by how big, big of a success both the stage production and the film has become? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, right? This was just <laughs> me and my friends and we we did this little show and, and we had a two and a half week run in Sheffield in 2015, was it? 20, no, 2017. 2017. Uh, and uh, that was it. And then everything happened. So no, I mean, you kind of like dream about it. Everything I do, I think this is the one that's going to be huge yeah. because I think you have to kind of believe that when you're writing it and then it never is. Mm -hmm. But with this, it, it has become it. So yeah, we all sort of had a daydream. Wouldn't it be nice if, but none of us really thought all this would happen. We're continually mm -hmm. surprised and delighted. <laughs> for sure. Now, for those who have not seen either, what makes everybody talking about Jamie worth checking out? It's a lot of fun. You'll laugh all throughout one you will cry in act two and you'll go home dancing. It's, it's just a story about a boy and his mom and his best friend and his dream. It's, it's, you know, we all have something we wanna do when we're that age 
Uh, Jamie is a bit more proactive than most, but it is a very simple, very accessible story. But then the songs make it epic. The songs just lift it up into another level. It's all about human emotion. It's like watching real people, the way they talk, the way they act, the things that motivate them. They are like people that you know, people that you are. And then the musical just takes it off somewhere else. It feels very real. And that's one of the reasons we have such a big fan base of people who don't normally like musicals. Mm-hmm. And although it is at its heart a very gay story because Jamie is a, is a queer teenager who wants to be a drag queen, we have a, a significant fan base of people who are not from that community, young girls who just see themselves in pretty or just fall in love with the idea of friendship with Jamie. He's like not the pinup that they dream they could marry, but the pinup that they just wish they could go to the shops with on a Saturday. <laughs> we have grannies, we have granddads, we have everyone. Our, our audience is so diverse, which I'm really, really proud of. And it's because although it is a gay story, it's also everybody's story. Everybody's Jamie so wants to wear a dress. That's his dream. But we all have a version of that dress we want to put on and it celebrates that and people are drawn to it um, because they see their own lives in ways that I couldn't have even begun to imagine when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Now, is it true that this was your first time not only writing a musical, but writing for theatre? Yeah, yeah. And writing songs. So Dan's an old hand with with the songs and Johnny's an old hand with the theatre. And then when we made the film, although it was my first film, I've been writing for the screen for, you know, 20 years. So um, I, we, we've all got our different areas of expertise, but at any point there was always one of us who didn't have a clue what they were doing. <laughs> and, and often it was me. Yeah, no, it was my first theatre. It was, um, it was a, yeah, it was a huge leap into the into the dark. Uh, and but has been fantastic. Nice. And now you're being compared as the uh, next Ryan Murphy. How does that feel? Oh, well, that's that's a compliment, isn't it? I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm too British to not. <laughs> very nice to say that that's ridiculous and you're, you're being silly but um i you know i i think the way that he has pushed those those queer stories to the forefront and kept them accessible because that's what's really important to me now there's a version of jamie which we would could have made and would have made where we played at um a very kind of cutting edge small theater like the royal court in london that puts on kind of challenging exciting plays which i you know i'd love going there mm-hmm. um and we would have had you know a couple of thousand people see it and we could have done this quite sort of challenging, difficult show, and maybe he would have died at the end because that's what tends to happen to gay characters in plays. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know, if, if critics would have loved it, and a few people would have seen it, and that would be it. But what we wanted to do was make something that everyone would want to watch, that it doesn't feel like, oh god, it's a play, or oh, I've got to go. It's good to go to the theatre. I'll go and punish myself, and then afterwards we can go out for a meal and feel that we we did something good because we saw a play. It should be something that you just can't not see. It's too much fun. And with someone like Ryan Murphy, you know, he's reworked out how to take quite complex ideas and make them very, very accessible. So that that's something that, that I aspire to more than anything. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Now, who did you say was playing Jamie in the L.A. production? Leighton Williams, who yeah. has played Jamie on the West End. He was our second Jamie on the West End. He is playing Jamie in the UK tour at the moment. But the UK tour is doing a little stop off at the Armisen in Los Angeles for a few weeks. And so Leighton's uh, coming out there with uh, Roy Haylock, a.k.a. Bianca Del Rio, who was yeah. in the British show. So he's, it's the entire British company have come over. Um, and they are, as you can imagine, incredibly excited. Mm-hmm. I think Roy, who would be the first to admit he is not a singer, uh, <laughs> the fact that he is in a musical and has two big numbers continues to delight him um, because he is in some ways the most unlikely casting, but he's a fantastic performer, company member. Mm-hmm. He's, he's just wonderful. And you, he comes on as himself, well, not as himself, as a, as a boy, first of all. Yeah. And then, okay. he, then he turns up in drag with a Bianca face on at the end of Act One, and the audience always go nuts because no one really sees him as him. And then you see the transformation mm-hmm. and he comes back on as him at the end. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic cast. Awesome. Now, in the film, Max Harwood plays uh, Jamie, and this is his acting debut. What yes. made him perfect for the role? Well, we were all doing our first film. <laughs> so Max, Lauren, who plays Pretty, um, nearly all of the Year 11 kids. Year 11 is the, um, it's the top year of high school uh, in the UK, so 16-year-olds. Uh, me and Dan and Johnny, we were all on our first film. So we got to kind of hold each other's hands, which was great because uh, it, 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 it was... For all of us, it was terrifying in different ways. Mm-hmm. But we saw, I think, 3,000 kids to, to, to pick Jamie. We, we did open auditions. Um, Max was actually in his second year at a dance uh, school uh, as a um, like degree level, university level. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, um, we were seeing people who, who had trained or hadn't trained. Or, you know, maybe we saw a bunch of actual 16-year-olds as well. Uh, and, and Max was just the one that, you know, it, it, he stood out. And it was, um, it, was, it was a really tough process because you're asking such a lot of your lead actor. Yeah. Uh, to, to sing, dance, act, 
look like they're 16 and be able to do drag to walk in those heels i mean it's it's more than a triple threat it's you know so oh, sure whatever five threat would be single, <laughs> single threat. i don't know what that'd be uh penta threat and uh it was uh it was yeah it was, it was a big old process um and we were very lucky to find it yes for sure now are there any plans to take everybody's talking about jamie to broadway well i mean that's that's been our dream for a long time and if Jamie's taught me anything, it's that no dream is impossible. So I would love to be there, but it all depends on how it does in LA. And uh, and obviously with COVID, there's, there's a big backlog for theatre, so it won't be anytime soon. But but if you want to come along and watch it and cheer <laughs> and shout as loud as you can, then in the end, Broadway will hear, because that's yeah. what happened. Our two and a half weeks in Sheffield, we were we were the biggest thing to have happened to that theatre for 10 years. It went insane. It was like a rock concert every night. And when people love something that much, London sits up and takes notice. Yeah. So we had London come to Sheffield in the form of Nika Burns, our fantastic producer, who was also producing the, um, the LA production. And if we can do the same thing here, then in the same way that Sheffield, where we opened, will always own Jamie. I hope that LA can feel like they own the American production. Yes, for sure. Hope so. Now, you are entirely self-taught in screenwriting, playwriting, and script, okay. scripting for yeah. television, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What made you want to pursue this kind of career? I, I, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Um, I just didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I always wanted to do film. I, I'd never thought of doing theatre or TV. That kind of came along later when I just became, once I was a writer and I found that I really did enjoy it, it wasn't just a means to an end of getting a movie made. Then, um, then I, I, I sort of started to branch out of it in books and, um, you know, in our songs, so lots of different things. But I think if you, training is, is always vital, but there's just lots of different ways that you can do it. So, I mean, I say I'm self-taught, but also, I, you know, I got to work with fantastic, experienced people on, on every job I've learned something. So I'm only self-taught because I was surrounded by teachers. And yeah. that you could say, you know, anyone who goes and formally trains is self-taught because you take out what you put in. Um, there's less structure to mine, but it was a training. And education is the most fantastic thing. It just doesn't always end when you leave university or school. And it doesn't always, um, you don't always miss out on it if you don't go to those places. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can have a certain false confidence, I think, if you graduate and you've got a piece of paper and you can say, look, you have to give me this job because here it says this. If you don't have that, then all you've got is yourself and, and your kind of commitment to do the best work that you can. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, kind of not training for me was great, but I wouldn't say that it's bad for other people to do it. it it works differently for different people yeah for sure definitely and you are one of the only creators to adapt your own source material from stage to screen how yeah. si how significant is that well, i guess it's partly because we it all happened so quickly in fact actually we got the movie um uh, rolling before we had the west end transfer because in our two weeks it was a very busy two weeks at the end of the first week Warp Films, who are our producers, came to see the show and, and offered to make the movie. And at the end of the second week, Nika Burns, who's NIMAX Productions, the theatre productions, came to see the show and offered to take us to the West End and now around the world. So actually the movie, the, the, the deal to do the movie is, is a week older than anything else that happened with the stage show. Mm. Um, and because it was so, you know, the show had only been out for a year or so, I think when we started working on the film. So it made sense that we put the team together. We all wanted to do it. I don't think we would have agreed to have done it under any other circumstances. Mm. Work with your best friends. It's great advice because you always have each other's backs. And yeah. me and Dan and Johnny, um, we always speak as one voice. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was a thrill to kind of do it because the stage show was still on. So I was like, you know, we'd have, you know, it'd be the second birthday, the third birthday, I'd be going to watch the show in the West End and watch it on tour whilst we were making the film or whilst I was writing bits of the film. So it was always kind of all happening at the same time, which is unusual, but it was a great way to do it because you always had this energy behind it. It always felt like it was alive. Mm -hmm, for sure. Great. Do you have any upcoming musicals in the works? Yes. Anything you can talk about? No. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a few, but more than a few. Cool. Well, in addition to film and screen, uh, you have published three children's books and will be writing the live action CGI ad ad adaptation of M.G. Leonard's Beetle Boy, you hear books, Jesus, a mouthful. <laughs> so what can you tell us about this? Well, um, I that that's all very early days. Uh, and I've, I've worked out the story, how it worked on screen and, and someone's going to go and sell it. But it's, it's, it's a lovely, um, there's three books and they're, they're unlike anything else you've ever read. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my own books, I, it's been a while since I did a book, but I, I wrote three children's books. And the first um, won the Parents' Choice in the US, which was a very big deal, although I didn't know that at the time, no one told me. 
And then about two years later, I'd worked out that it actually it, did, it was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just that the first book I wrote was a, a kind of a bet with my oldest friend, whose kids are my godchildren. She works in children's publishing. And I said, anyone could write a children's picture book. I said, no, it's much harder than you think. I said, I bet I can write one in half an hour. So I did, and that was the first one. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to do the second one, and I realized that every idea I'd ever had was rolling around in my head in that half hour. And actually, the second one was really hard. And then the third one was really hard. So maybe everyone's got one kid's book in them, but trying to keep going is really difficult because you, you burn through your ideas. But there, there were lovely things to do, and I hope I'll write another one someday. For sure. Nice. All right, Tom. Well, how can one stay up to date with you? Uh, you can find me on Insta, uh, Tom McWriter, T-O-M-M-A-C-W-R-I-T-E-R, and the same on, uh, what's the other one, Twitter. Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, once we, rehearsal starts tomorrow, so I'm going to be, I'll be tweeting some pictures, tomorrow being uh, Wednesday the uh, 12th, oh. I don't know when this goes out. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so there'll, there'll, be, there'll be some content to come out, and I'll, um, I'll keep the fans occupied with some good behind-the-scenes pictures. Perfect. All right. Well, before we wrap up, are there any other upcoming projects or anything else you would like to mention or plug at this time? I, I, I don't think I could talk about anything yet, but there, there is, there's, there's a, a lovely movie that I'm working on uh, at the moment, like literally at the moment when I finish talking to you, I'll be tapped up away. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and there's some musical projects for stage and screen, which, uh, which will be coming out in the next kind of year or so. Um, so hopefully that will all work. Okay, fantastic. Okay, just give me one second here. Go ahead and end this.